Welcome to the Kentucky History Channel, where we strive to bring you all the Kentucky history content you want and you deserve. Kentucky is a part of all of us, and we plan on covering all the history we can, from Pike County to Fulton County, from Louisville to Harlan. Here on our YouTube channel, you can find many videos dedicated to different events, people, governors, and places in Kentucky. There's something for everybody. While you're here, if you like the channel, hit the subscribe button and the notification button so you get notified anytime new Kentucky history is available. And if you want to support the channel, we have a Patreon page as well, or patreon.com slash kyhistorypod. Welcome back to the Kentucky History Podcast. I'm your host, Jameson Cable, and we're going to continue talking with Kenny Tab about Elizabethtown and Hardin County history. Uh, one question, and we, and we kind of already talked about this. When did, when did the railroad come in? Okay. Uh, obviously, right. before the Civil right. War. 1860, uh, the railroad opened. And, uh, of course, going through Muldrow Hills was one of the biggest challenges they had. And they had the two railroad bridges I alluded to earlier. And here's here's what happened, though. Governor <clears throat> Governor John Helm was the first president of the Ellen Railroad. So he, he established that all passenger tra- trains would have to stop in Elizabethtown. Okay. So you could, at one point in the 1800s, you could get on as many as five trains to and from Louisville. And people would get on, yeah. in, which kind of blows my mind, in the 1800s in Elizabethtown and go shopping in Louisville and come back. <laughs> yeah, and that is. So one of the, the E-Towns downtown really didn't develop like it should have because of this access that they had to Louisville. The railroad. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So... <clears throat> It was there, and like I said, until uh, they quit having passenger service sometime about 1967, probably, was the last passenger service through Elizabethtown. And they used to have a train, the l and did, called the Hummingbird, and it was a passenger train. And it was a fast train between Louisville and Nashville, or Nashville and Louisville. No stops, Okay except if someone wanted to get on the train at E-Town or get off the train at E-Town, they had to stop. And that crew, <laughs> they said that crew didn't like that. <laughs> they didn't yeah. like that to stop at E-Town or to pick somebody up or let somebody off. But that was part yeah. of the part of the thing that John Helm, the first uh, president of the Illinois, Illinois Railroad, established when they started the Illinois Railroad. Wow. Wow. And that, I mean, that, that's... <laughs> That's uh, important because, sure. like that, probably said you know E town above some of these other exactly. smaller towns and, and you know, changes the course. So of you had more. another railroad. It was here in the early days, E town and Paducah Railroad, and the president okay. of that railroad was was from Elizabeth Town, and so anyway, uh, <laughs> That that helped the situation for Elizabeth Town to grow and Hardin mm-hmm. County to grow to have two railroads here. That railroad later on became part of the IC railroad. But Elizabeth Town mm-hmm. reneged on some bonds after Samuel Beale Thomas, who was uh, president and one of the first millionaires in Kentucky. They reneged on some bonds after he died, and they moved they moved the shop to Paducah one year. Second year, they moved the office to Louisville. In the process, Elizabethtown in 1880 lost uh, 20% of their population. Oh, wow. Uh, maybe it was more than 20 cents. Maybe it was one third. But anyway, it took them 40 years to regain the population they had in 1880. It wasn't until 1920 they got that population back. Wow. Because they lost all Jeez. those jobs. It was a big deal. Uh-huh. Well, jobs yeah. is what it's all about. You know, <laughs> so, uh, anyway, yeah. that was uh, that was that. I was talking about Samuel Beale Thomas. He owned the stagecoach line between uh, Louisville and Nashville. And uh, Jenny Lind was uh, was a rock star in eighteen fifties. She was a Swedish nightingale. They called her. She uh, P. T. Barnum brought her to America to perform, mm-hmm. and they had performed in Nashville. And then uh, he got on a 
riverboat went up the Cumberland River into Ohio River onto Louisville. She came by stagecoach. She spent the night in Elizabethtown there on the square at the Eagle House. And uh, that building is still standing today. She went up the street behind the Eagle House, the Brown Pusey House, and sang on the steps of the Brown Pusey House. We have a cape that belonged to her that's in the History Museum. I don't know. We got oh, a cape, cool. but we got a cape. But <laughs> she, she was like uh, Elvis Presley, Michael Jackson, and everybody else put together in those days. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The big yeah. Cape. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that's pretty cool. Um, well, and you know, just mentioned in the, the development of the railroad, when you look at these other counties and, like, say, you know, other, other, other parts of the state, you know, getting that railroad to those counties was so important because you know, they weren't able to kind of you know get out until they got connection to the railroad. Oh, absolutely. It was a big deal. It was a big thing. It's, mm -hmm. It had a big big part in making, you know, help America grow, of course. Transcontinental Railroad, you know, proves that, what happened. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so after the Civil War, you know, we mentioned a little bit about the, uh, already about the development of the, um, uh, well, oh, one, one more thing about the Civil War. Did they, bar did they burn the courthouse? No, they went in and they tore, tore some of his, Samuel Bill, excuse me, Samuel Haycraft Jr. was the county clerk at the time. He was a county clerk mm -hmm. for 40-some years, and he was the one who wrote the first history of this town, Hardin County. That's how we knew much oh, yeah. about the early. He was born right after his mom and dad got there in 1779, mm -hmm. 1780. Oh, wow. And so anyway, they, they did... Uh, they did scattered some papers around, but they didn't burn the courthouse. We still have, when I was county clerk, we still got mm -hmm. all the records that were there. From seven, oh, when Hardin good. County became a county, of course, Kentucky became a state in 1792. One of the first mm -hmm. legislatures that met didn't meet until 1793. And one of the first things they did was create Hardin County, Kentucky. So we have all yeah. the records from back from 1792. Got all the marriages, all the wills. Oh, that's awesome. Now, here's yeah. another thing. When I was clerk, I was fortunate to get all the records on the Internet. You can go to the Hardin County Clerk's oh. website, and you can pull up wills, marriage, wow. deeds, and mortgages, whatever, that's awesome. whatever you want. <laughs> when I first became clerk, the, the room where all the records were was full of people doing idle uh -huh. searches, you know, lawyers coming in, individuals doing genealogical work, what have you. When I left there yeah. after 17 years, nobody was in that room. They could all <laughs> get all that information off their computer at home. Yeah. Wow. So, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's uh, again, go back to the question you had. I can't remember. I get off track here and start talking about it. That's okay. But, yeah. <laughs> Courthouse never burned. Oh, no, it never burned, and uh, that's why we have yeah. all those records. Now, I'll tell you what happened. In nineteen in 1870, they built a courthouse in the middle of the square. Uh, prior to that, the courthouse had been set off over in one corner of the square, mm -hmm. and uh, that's where it was during the Civil War. And there's a cannonball in a building downtown that Morgan had fired from the Cemetery Hill, uh, and it was a three-story building at the time. And it hit that building and stuck in that wall. Okay. Oh, wow. Is this, I mean, it's still there? Here's, here's the rest of the story. So <laughs> at that time, there wasn't anything in the middle of the square. That was just a common area, grassland, whatever. People would go in there. No building. And that's how that cannonball was able to hit that building. If that courthouse the Saturday day had been there, it would have hit the courthouse. It wouldn't have hit that building. But in 1869, they had a fire this down and they've had several fires over the years downtown it burned that building and some other buildings that cannon uh, that cannonball was saved when they built the building back that's there now they put that cannonball in that building in the same proximity the other cannonball was it's the same <laughs> cannonball but it's in a different building so they built the courthouse that's in the middle of the square the first time in 1870 and it was a nice courthouse it was it was ornate. It had a big uh, bell tower in it and it had a clock on four sides of it. Oh, wow. So yeah. it burned in 1932, caught on fire, the bell tower did. And, but they were able to get the records out. And one of the way, which was unheard of, they couldn't do that today, but 
Little Town High School was just up the street a block away. And the boys from the high school came down and helped carry the records out of the burning building. Oh, yeah. wow. <laughs> you wouldn't, you wouldn't have, you know, they wouldn't be able to do that today because of all five <laughs> buildings and so forth. So yeah. they built the building that's there now, the courthouse is there now. That building was built in 1932, 33. Okay. Well, yeah, well, and the, it's really a true, um, blessing not to have a courthouse burn and that oh, sounds exactly. crazy but like the hard uh, can't lost a lot uh, of their records for example oh uh, yeah so. yeah well and then um uh the um so i'm, I'm originally from rock castle county and like it, it's courthouse burn like three times mm. um and it, it just makes right. it difficult and in lincoln county now i know their courthouse never burned uh so like you know if you're from rock castle and your know, lincoln county was an old county um, you could go to Lincoln County and find some of that old information, but it's like there's a time gap mm -hmm. you know, the, of, of research. It's kind of hard to determine some of the things. Exactly. Um, yeah. See, uh, Hardin uh, County came off of Nelson County. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nelson came off Jefferson County. Mm -hmm. Jefferson County was one of yes. the first counties. It came off of what Kentucky County. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Jefferson, Fayette, and Lincoln were those first, first three. First three counties, mm -hmm. and then, um, you know, well, and they, they were so big. I mean, exactly. You know, oh, well, well, nice. And I don't see it. Well, that's another <laughs> another discussion for another day. <laughs> um, so, at, you know, at, at before the courthouse, I was going to bring up after Civil War, uh, you know, we mentioned the little gap there with the train where it kind of, you know, or, or, or well, the employment dropped down and population. Right. What kind of anything else well, big happened well, in that? Well, it was time? ironic. After the Civil War, if you wanted to be elected to a local office, like sheriff, mm -hmm. county clerk, mm -hmm. jailer, judge, whatever, you had to be a Confederate veteran. <laughs> uh -huh. And that went on for several years. And um, see, uh, the governors even of Kentucky, several of them were Civil War Confederate veterans too, after the Civil War. So Kentucky became more, after the Civil War, they became more pro-Southern than they were before the Civil War. Before. <laughs> yeah. I guess it was because one of the way, one of the reasons was because of Reconstruction, the way the North treated them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and I feel like, too, and I, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, the more Western side of Kentucky was definitely more pro-Southern. Um, yeah. That's to say the east. Yes, you they, there, there was more slavery in the western part mm -hmm. than there was the eastern part because of the plantation style farms that they had mm -hmm. in western Kentucky. Uh, John Helm and Samuel Bill Thomas were the two biggest uh, slave owners in Hardin County. One of them had mm -hmm. fifty, and one of them had seventy slaves. So there was mm -hmm. there was slavery here too. Yeah. 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 Um, so I, I guess like, you know, turn of the century, you know, you can't bring up, you know, Kentucky without talking about a coal, but Hardin, uh, you know, Elizabethtown, no, no real coal. No coal. We have no coal in Hardin County. Of course we had, uh, Burley tobacco, uh, tobacco mm -hmm. always been big. Had several farms. Used to have a lot of dairy farms down to about a, about maybe four or five in the whole County now. I don't know where all the milk's oh, wow. going to come from in the future, but all the dairies <laughs> are gone. But I guess they've, they've all become great big dairies now, you know, the ones that do exist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But Fort Knox. Um, Fort, Fort, Fort Knox. Fort, 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 <laughs> Fort Knox has been <laughs> Hardin County's salvation. I mean, it, that mean, without Fort Knox, Hardin County would not have prospered like it has. Uh, at one time, uh, when you had a lot of civil service jobs over there, Hardin County had one of the highest per capita incomes in the state. When all those civil service jobs, a lot of them went, up, went by the wayside and you had contract contractors come in and take those jobs, the contractors didn't pay the salaries that the government had paid on civil service. So you had some, some fall in the standard of living, so to speak. And the, I think, uh, uh, Versailles has the highest per capita of the county Versailles 
mm-hmm. uh, then has the highest per capita income in Kentucky, the last figure I saw. Mm-hmm. Uh, they got a lot of horse. Yeah. <laughs> horse farm. <laughs> and I think that's one of the reasons that's. Yeah. They can be expensive. <laughs> But we didn't, uh, we don't, here's another thing is, is ironic. Uh, we didn't have any distilleries much here. And mm-hmm. Bardstown, just 25 miles to the east, had all kinds of distilleries. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> now, I don't know if, if it's because uh, Elizabethtown was settled by Baptists. <laughs> Bardstown was settled by Catholics. Is that what <laughs> I don't know if that has anything to do with it or not. But uh, like I was telling you, Severus Valley Baptist Church, the oldest Baptist. Yeah, yeah. But. Uh, the last distillery before the one they have now was the Ashton Distillery here in Elizabeth, mm-hmm. and it closed about 1904, 1902. Yeah. And then they didn't have one until Boundary Oak Distillery um, opened here just a few years ago in Radcliffe. And they went up where the Challenger Center used to be in Radcliffe and used that as their distillery now. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's that's the first. Now, I will say another big distillery is being currently being built in Elizabethtown. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it's supposed to be a big one. Yeah. Okay, well, well, I mean, you know, more, more coming uh, to Elizabethtown. That's a- <laughs> yeah, well, you know, bourbon is so big. Yeah. In Kentucky, you know, Kentucky bourbon is is being sold all over the world, apparently. Oh, yeah. yeah. And it, it's it's really, really big right now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, any, well, any other, like, I guess, uh, since we're talking about industries and stuff that um, come to mind, I mean, well, besides... see, we, we got Matalsa here. Mm-hmm. They make all the frames for F-150 pickup trucks. Oh, okay. And you got about 2,000 people working at factory here. Mm-hmm. You got, uh, you got windshields made here, AGC. Yeah. You got brakes made here. Man, yeah, that's all. You got... A lot of car-related industry here. Uh, yeah, automotive industry is in is oh, right there. It, it's here. There's several thousand uh, industrial jobs here in Elizabethtown. Mm-hmm. Wow. Uh, yeah. What about since you run public uh, education as well? well? Let's talk about some of the schools of right. Uh, Hardy had, County and possibly right. even consolidation and those sorts of things oh, yeah. that they all comes. One time there was over 100 one-room schoolhouses in Hardin County. That's a lot. Yeah. They were everywhere. Uh, my dad was born in 1900. My mom was born in 1904. Uh, my dad went to Flint Hill, one-room school, and my mom went to Roaring Springs, one-room school, and they were both in the south end of the county. Mm-hmm. And, uh, of course, back then, you know, kids would stay in uh, in school, those one-room schools, they'd stay until they were 15, 16 years old. Yeah. Yeah. Because there wasn't any high schools around. And my mom, just to give you an example, it was nine in her family. And only the youngest one got to go to high school, and she had to move to Upton and live in Upton to go to Upton High School. Wow. Because it was so far away from where they lived, down in the Cash area. Yeah. Hardin County. And, um, but anyway, over the years, those one-room schools just kept on consolidating. and. Mm-hmm. You had a, several high schools in Hardin County up until 1962-63. And the county did a big uh, consolidation. They consolidated Sonora and Glendale High Schools into East Hardin High School. They consolidated Howe Valley and Linville High Schools into West Hardin High School. And they consolidated Vine Grove and Rineville High Schools into North Hardin High School. Mm-hmm. Now, at the time they did that, Radcliffe wasn't very large. See, Radcliffe didn't become an incorporated city until 1956. Wow. Yeah. It was, it's right out, you know, it's right there on the doorstep of Fort Knox. Radcliffe mm-hmm. today has over 25,000 people. Vice Row has another 10,000 probably. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Of course, Elizabethtown's probably 30 plus now. Yeah. 35, maybe 40,000, but you, not all of Elizabethtown's in the city limits. <laughs> a lot of, you got a lot of subdivisions and developments that are not in the city limits, but they, mm-hmm. they're right there on the border of it. Yeah. But anyway, those high schools all became, you know, took their, we went from six to three, for example. Yeah. And uh, now, then later on in 1990, they consolidated East and West Harden to make Central Harden High School. And it's a very big high school. It's about 2,000 students. Wow. 
Yeah. Then they, they created John Harden High School north of E-Town uh, <laughs> before they consolidated East and no, right after they consolidated East and West, they made John Harden High School between E-Town and Radcliffe. And of course, North Harden High School today is in, uh, in Radcliffe and it's probably got 1,400, 1,500 students. Wow. So you got some big high schools. Yeah. And of course, you got a lot of middle schools and elementary schools throughout mm-hmm. the country. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, education, public education has provided a lot of jobs. You and I, it's <laughs> the point. Uh, so a lot of people have made a living off public education. And, mm-hmm. and I hope public education can continue on. A lot of people mm-hmm. have uh, become what they are because of public education. I think this country is great because we've had public education mm-hmm. and the masses have been educated. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as those uh, consolidations went, uh, was everybody cool with it or was there a lot of a... <laughs> well, not really. Uh, in 62, it was, it was really uh, controversial. Uh, mm-hmm. You had one board member that lost his seat as a result of it. Oh, uh, some of the schools now East Harden seemed to be they seemed to got off to a better start between Glendale and Sonora to make East Harden then say for example uh, North Harden uh, North Harden uh, Vine, Vine Grove and Rineville were competitive at the mm-hmm. time and it seems like those kids didn't it took them a little bit longer to jail <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> long yeah. So, yeah, there there was some problems. Now, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of controversy. Some people hate to see East and West Harden closed. Uh, I know I was at East Harden, and we were at the top of our game at the time. Mm-hmm. We had about a thousand students, and we were excelling in everything at the po- at that point. Mm-hmm. And so we, the kids that ever went to there, they still have a great uh, fondness of that school. Yeah. Same same with West Harden. They were doing a good job too. And and the, all the county schools, they're, they're they're doing a good job. Public schools, they're they have their hands full. Hey, you know all about that. <laughs> yeah. all about that now. You're expected to do so much. Oh yeah, yeah. You, you know, you're you're required to do more than just teach. You mm-hmm. investigator you kind of uh, <laughs> come up that you have to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, like so uh, on the sports end, like the rivalries. And oh, now yeah. e- E-Town, oh, or E-Town. Town still has its own it has, high school it's as well. An it's an independent school system. Mm-hmm. Town is. And I'll tell you another story. West Point is an independent school system. Okay. Yeah. It was. Okay. It was the smallest independent school system in the state. Oh, wow. In 1957, the state came into West Point and said, you can no longer have a high school because you're too small. Oh. They had just won the district tournament in 57. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. And that was when there was about 10 high schools in the county. Yeah. yeah. You had uh, E-Town Catholic at that time had a high school, mm-hmm. which no longer has one now. But um, anyway, instead of sending the kids to the county, they worked a deal out in Elizabethtown to send, bus their kids about 20 miles one way or longer to Elizabethtown High School. Wow. What it was, four of their basketball players were coming back. <laughs> oh. <laughs> they had won the district tournament. <laughs> At the time, Elizabethtown had never been the state tournament. I think they saw that they hey, we get those West Point players and what players we got. <laughs> Plus, they got two other players in from Litchfield that moved in. They had all kinds of material. <laughs> and plus, they got West Point's coach. Oh, Okay. Uh, who later on became Elizabethtown High School principal, Charlie Rollins. Uh-huh. Charlie, he's no longer with us, but he was a great guy. Mm-hmm. But anyway, that's that's what they did from 1957, 58 until two years ago. Wow. They wow. finally quit sending their kids to Elizabethtown High School and sent them to North Harden. Gotcha. Wow. But they were traveling that far, back and forth each day, all those years. Oh, wow. That's, they kept yeah. uh, they kept going, but uh, like I said, Lipstown Catholic had a high school at one time, uh, no longer. Mm-hmm. But the rival you talk about rivalries, um, of course, Lipstown High School is, is everybody's rival out in mm-hmm. the county. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. City, county thing, you know, it's everywhere. Oh yeah. All, all that, that, that. And they've had a they've had a good record with their athletic program and academic program in Elizabeth Town. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They had a they didn't have a high school really in Elizabeth Town until about 1912. Mm -hmm. And it was across the street from the State Theater and diagonally across from the History, History Museum. And it's in the where the parking lot is now next to City Hall. City Hall in Elizabeth Town is right across from the History Museum at the corner of US 62 and US 31W. In 1955, in July of 55, the old high school blew up. Oh. It happened at nighttime. Uh -huh. I rode my bicycle down there the next morning, the next day, and it looked like a bomb had hit it. Wow. Knocked the windows out of Severance Valley Baptist Church next door, mm -hmm. where City Hall is now. Knocked the windows out of Presbyterian Church, where the Kentucky Basketball Hall of Fame is now. Yeah. Okay. It knocked the windows out of the paint motor company across the street. Mm -hmm. Luckily, they were building a new high school. So they rushed it up and got the high school ready for the 55, 56 school year. Mm -hmm. But that was, that was in July of 55. Well, what happened? Uh, <clears throat> well, it, they really didn't know. They think maybe it was a natural gas explosion. Yeah. Wow. But they, they weren't certain. They never were certain as to really mm -hmm. what happened. Wow. Good thing nobody's in it. <laughs> exactly. It happened at nighttime, too. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, well, um, what, so, and you, you mentioned this before. Uh, you mentioned some of the other cities and, and towns because um, because that's that's what you know oftentimes we kind of want to address those a little well, bit on the uh, further, on the furthest part south as far south as you can go in Hardin County before it goes in Hart County you have Upton mm -hmm. and Upton's a unique town 31W splits the town mm -hmm. as you go south on 31W the right hand side's in Hardin County and the left hand side's in LaRue County oh, okay yeah. yeah and then you just go out of town just a few hundred yards and you're in Hart County on the south side Okay. <laughs> so then you come up the, uh, you come up by 65, so to speak, near Sonora, where, mm -hmm. where I was born. And then uh, you have, uh, after that, you have Glendale and then Elizabeth Town. But when you go down to West Kentucky Parkway, leaving Elizabeth Town, uh, I guess the first community exit you have is uh, White Mills and Eastview. Mm -hmm. And if you go <clears throat> the bluegrass west, uh, you don't really have any any towns because what you get into just as soon as you go east on the blue guys leaving this town are the knobs oh gotcha and then you come off the knobs you go in you're going across rolling fork river into nelson county yeah so uh then you go north of e-town and you have of course again radcliffe vine grove mm -hmm. and then further north on the ohio river on 31w is west point mm -hmm. Where yeah. the Salt River empties into the Ohio. Yeah. You know, the Salt River starts over in your area, over in Mercer County, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And flows all the way across there to the Ohio River. Well, you think about um, those early settlers and stuff. That's, you know, that's. Yeah, yeah they had that river transportation. Right? Yeah, that's, that's how it went. Yeah. The Kentucky River played a big part mm -hmm. in settling uh, all that area. Yeah. yeah. During World War II, mm -hmm. this town was. This town was full of GIs and their spouses. <laughs> and that, that's like what I was telling you, like how Spiro, Spiro Agnew got there and lived there. Yeah. And everybody in town during World War II, if they had a spare room, they had it rented out to a GI or a GI's wife. And uh, it was the town was full because at the time they didn't have any. Uh, there's Radcliffe didn't, didn't much more exist there. It was just. It just, it just wasn't there. You'd, you'd yeah. come off post and you'd either go to the right and go to Louisville or you'd go to the left and go to Elizabeth Town. Yeah. And back then, Hardin County was wet. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in 1942, it got so bad with all the GIs coming to town. And back then, for some reason, drunkenness was, was bad. Yeah. <laughs> And they got to land in people's yards and what have you. And they would have so many. My dad told me this story. He was a deputy sheriff at the time. And there was only two deputies and a high sheriff. Oh. So they had to have the MPs come down and help them. And they'd have so many of them rounded up at midnight that, that, that Fort Knox would send down a cattle truck. 
Oh man. <laughs> They'd load them up, and put them back on the cattle truck, take them back to post because see the Harding County Jail at that time was just in a house, <laughs> a Victorian type house, <laughs> wasn't big enough to house all the problems. <laughs> so anyway, in October, see September, September of 1942, they had a local option election mm. and they voted the county dry. Uh. In October of 42, it went dry. Wow. It stayed It stayed dry until Radcliffe passed a restaurant uh, provision, mm -hmm. local option election, where you had to have 100 seats. 70% 70, 70 of your income had to be derived from food and only 30% from alcohol. Mm -hmm. They passed that about 2001 or two. That was the first time since 1942 wow. anything in Hardin County had been wet. Uh -huh. I was county clerk. I had 13 wet, dry elections in Hardin wow. County. Wow. I, I had them every way you could have them. I had them for <laughs> cities. I had them for golf courses. Yeah. I had a restaurant provision. I had the full blown wet, dry election. I had all <laughs> sorts of elections. 13 of them. I think I'm on wow. record at that. That, that might have to kind of be a record. <laughs> it was. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> gosh. Wow. Well, but now, now Elizabethtown and uh, Radcliffe and Vine Grove are all wet. Mm -hmm. But the county, the unincorporated portions of Hardin County are still dry. Okay. Wow. Well, that's interesting, though, because a lot of those, a lot of the counties, you know, in and around, in and, uh, around Kentucky, you know, went dry. After prohibition, you know, prohibition was repealed, and they all went, they just all stayed dry. It, it's pretty interesting that uh, the the cause that uh, uh, you know, Harding County let faced me, there. Let me tell you one story about prohibition. Mm -hmm. Prior to prohibition, a lady going around the nation called Carrie Nation uh -huh, uh -huh. with a hatchet. Yep, she was busting up bars and saloons and mirrors and whatever else she could hit with that hatchet. <laughs> Uh, about 1904 or two, I can't remember now exactly. She came to Elizabethtown and to make a speech at the uh, uh, about pro uh, prohibition. Mm -hmm. And uh, so she goes down the street around the square, and there was a saloon keeper by the name of J.R. Neighbors had a saloon there. And he was sitting out front in a chair, he's a saloon tavern. And she come down the street and she started berating him and telling him what she was going to do to his establishment. He took the chair and hit her upside the head. Oh. Oh, bad, bad, bad news. Bloodied her up. Uh, it made national news. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> in the process, he was, he was arrested and fined, I think, maybe $15. Mm -hmm. Every Thursday night in the summertime, from the, from June to the end of September, they have a what they call a downtown walking tour. Mm -hmm. now, all of these characters from E Town's past come out in costume, and they act like they're that person. Yeah. So you'll have you know uh, all these uh, all these different people. Custer, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, Philip Arnold, that, that's another one. That, that, that's a crazy story. Philip mm -hmm. Arnold and his brother did the great diamond hoax. Oh. And they, oh yeah, they fooled. This was in the uh, 18, 18, uh, 80s mm -hmm. after the Civil War. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, 1870s after the Civil War. And they went through England and bought diamonds, rubies, and what have you. Uh -huh. Took them out west to an abandoned mine. He and his cousin, John Slack. They salted the mine. They went into a bank in uh, San Francisco with a bag of diamonds right at closing time. Told the clerk, said, we want to put this in your safe deposit box, but don't let anybody see what's in it. Don't look. Don't you look in there. No one uh -huh. he would. Yeah. They leave. Of course, he looks in there. Then he goes and tells the people in San Francisco, the right people, the richest people, what's going on. So they start taking these people out to this abandoned mine from San Francisco. Uh -huh. And then when, before they get there, they blindfold them, turn them around a bunch of times and take them to where the mine is. 
take the, take the uh, blindfold off and they start seeing diamonds, rubies, and everything else. They start picking it up, seeing money. Mm -hmm. They sold stock in this so-called diamond mine. Yeah. To the richest people in the United States, Rothschild, Tiffany, General, mm -hmm. all kinds of people. So when they got the money, they split it up, and uh, Philip Arnold came back to E-Town. John Schlack, he went to New Mexico. Mm -hmm. Philip Arnold gets back. He builds the tallest building between uh, Louisville and Nashville on the square there in E-Town. Uh -huh. the Gilded, Gilded Age building. It's still standing. It's a law office now. Oh, wow. They also had a, a bank there on the square. And it was a small bank, wasn't that big. And the vault in that bank is in that building still there. It's a taco shop now. <laughs> <laughs> and so anyway, he gets into a an argument with a competitor banker on the square there in Elizabethtown. And he took his cane and he whipped this other banker. Uh -huh. Well, about two weeks later, he goes into one of the local saloons and, uh, this fellow that he had whipped, the fellow Holdsworth that he had whipped with his cane a couple of weeks before came in or was in there, and they got into a fist fight. Holdsworth left, and he went down to his bank on the square, got his shotgun, and came back up the street. When he came back up the street, Philip Arnold was coming out of the saloon. He saw Holdsworth coming with his shotguns. He pulled his pistol and shot at Holdsworth and missed him and hit somebody walking. Oh, on. Yeah, but Holdsworth got him with a blast to the shoulder mm -hmm. area there with a shotgun. He died a few weeks later of pneumonia complications. Mm -hmm. while he last. Had one of the biggest funerals in the history of E-Town. Wow. His monument in E-Town City Cemetery is still probably one of the biggest ones up there. They so have written books. He was on 20 team. Uh, he was on uh, Death Valley Days. And Ronald Reagan used to narrate. Uh-huh. 20 team, 20 mule team bull racks used to produce it, you know, in yeah. the 50s, 60s. But the segment that he was on, Robert Taylor did it that night. Uh, mm -hmm. Reagan had already gone on to something else. But did, it, that's a crazy story, right? That there. is. He is one of the characters on that Thursday night, every uh -huh. Thursday night. It's, it's six o'clock, I think it is. Mm -hmm. You'd be on the square there and you can get in on that tour. It's free. Yeah. And all the characters come out as you walk around the downtown area. Uh -huh. Well, one of the last ones to come out is Carrie Nation, and she'll come out, she's holding her head, going, <laughs> going off. We've even had motorists to stop to aid her, thinking it was something that really happened. Oh. <laughs> 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 stage, you know. But uh, you've got to see that on a Thursday night. If you're yeah. Did, did the diamond guy, did he get caught? I mean, did he get uh, caught well, or anything? He, 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 they did take him to uh, court, uh -huh. And I think maybe he did get fined or lost some of it, mm -hmm. but he had uh, the house he lived in is still standing today. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had a, supposedly he had a bear chained out in the front <laughs> lawn to keep uh, curiosity seekers away. Uh -huh. It was, you know, supposedly he had buried gold there. You know, yeah. Diamonds yeah. or whatever the case might be. But uh, yeah. he died in, uh, but like I said, they've uh, they made movies and they've written books mm -hmm. wow. uh, about it. Several books have been written about it. Yeah. Well, I might, I might need to get one of those. That's, that's a pretty interesting story. It is. We, we've got those books in the History Museum. Yeah. We've got a lot of different books in the History Museum. Oh, okay. Um, well, go ahead and uh, tell us about the History Museum and and so forth. Oh, yeah. The History Museum, it's, it's one of the nicest, prettiest buildings in town. It was... Uh, it was originally built as a United States post office in 1932, and it was designed by one of the top architects in the United States, James Wetmore. And um, so it's got, uh, you know, it's got the marble wainscot when you go in there, and it's got the terrazzo floor and lobby area. Uh, it's got all kinds of uh, ornate trim in the ceiling on the walls. And it remained a United States post office until 1965, and it move down the street for a bigger building and uh, the government gave the building to the Hardin County Fiscal Court so they turned it over they made it into the Hardin County Public Library 
and it remained the library until uh, 2002. And in 2002, uh, Mary Jo Jones, a local historian, older lady, and I, we convinced uh, fiscal court to let us use that building as a, as a museum. So, uh, I mean, we really had it good. I want to thank fiscal court for doing this because we couldn't do it without their help. They own the building, they pay the utilities, and they help us with a lot of the maintenance on the building. We only have volunteers. Oh, wow, that's great. We have a board of directors and we mm -hmm. have volunteers. We're open Tuesday through uh, Saturday. Uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, we're open uh, 10 to 2. Uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, we're open from 10 to 5. Uh, so, anyway, you need to stop by. It's free. Uh, people come in there and they can't believe what all we have all the exhibits and all the things they can see and all the history. Even the people that are from out of state, a lot of people come in for the sports park you were talking about. They got some downtime. They want something to do. They'll bring their kids down there. We've got a scavenger hunt that they can do, and they enjoy that, and the parents do too. Yeah, well. <laughs> anyway, I mean, it's just, it's just amazing as to what all is in there. Even those of us that were there when we first started, we cannot believe how it has evolved over the years. And uh, you'll, you'll really, when you come down, you're really going to enjoy the Hardin County History Museum. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, you know, one of those summer summer trips, I know people all about their vacations and stuff, but uh, I try to hit up some, you know, history We're museums. Looking forward to it. <laughs> oh, oh, I just yeah. want to thank you for uh, having me on this mm -hmm. program. And uh, let me talk about Hardin County history, which I'm really proud of. And I'm really proud of this county. Mm -hmm. We have a good county. We have a good state. We have a good country. So mm -hmm. what, what more can you ask for, right? We're very fortunate. Yes, sir. <laughs> we are. And I, you know, I will uh, you know, thank you as well for coming on and sharing this information. You know, it's one of the purposes of the podcast is, is kind of getting this uh, information out to people and so forth. And then hopefully they, you know, invest more into the, local history that's it's around them and I, you know we have people live here that's never been in the history museum and once oh, they yeah. trip there they say i can't believe this <laughs> <laughs> yeah so yeah it's been here the whole time you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah and that 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 local you know infusion you know can really take 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 hold of the um the history and and, and boost it up you know um and, and it's harder to you know get people kind of sometimes to invest and, and kind of get them to appreciate that, uh, you know, so, you know, where they came from, you said it earlier, you know, Lincoln, Boyle and Harrod, th those, you know, Stanford, Danville and Harrodsburg, I mean, were the center of Kentucky becoming a state and so forth. Absolutely. And, they sure were. Um, you know, and, 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 but then there's, there's places all over uh, the state that were just uh, very important to that community and building up and so forth. Um, so we, we thank you for coming on and, uh, sharing those stories about uh, Elizabethtown and Hardin County. Um, you know, some pretty old, old towns and old, old County, you know, they've been around for a while. Sure. Uh, yeah. Um, well, uh, Kenny, I, I thank you a bunch for coming on. Uh, anything else before we go? No, my dog just came in. So I guess it's time for us to leave. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, again, uh, thanks for coming on. Uh, we'll be, we'll be there. Uh, here in a few weeks, uh, maybe maybe a month or so, but this summer we're, we're coming we're coming to the the museum in Elizabethtown. So that's uh, great. Thanks again for uh, listening, and uh, we'll see y'all next time. All right, you have a good day. Welcome to the Kentucky History Channel, where we strive to bring you all the Kentucky history content you want and you deserve. Kentucky is a part of all of us, and we plan on covering all the history we can from Pike County to Fulton County, from Louisville to Harlan. Here on our YouTube channel, you can find many videos dedicated to different events, people, governors, and places in Kentucky. There's something for everybody. While you're here, if you like the channel, hit the subscribe button and the notification button so you get notified anytime new Kentucky history 
is available. And if you want to support the channel, we have a Patreon page as well, or patreon.com slash kyhistorypod. You've probably heard about Daniel Boone, but what about the rest of the frontiersmen who came to Kentucky and settled? That's what we want to bring to the Kentucky History Channel, the stories of the untold, the stories of those forgotten. One thing to expect on our channel is great Kentucky content. Some stories that you've never heard of. The Knight Riders, who began in Western Kentucky. Bloody Monday, the riots in Louisville. The assassination of Governor Goebel, the only governor ever assassinated in the United States. Stories from all over Kentucky, stories that are unforgettable once you've heard them. You can find out who counties in Kentucky are named after and how your county got started. From beginning to end, we plan to document every county in Kentucky, all 120. Reach out to us on all of our social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And also leave a comment on one of our YouTube videos. You can also check out our podcast episodes. You can subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and many more. We're always seeking to find more Kentucky history so we can bring it to you. The viewers, the listeners, we want all the stories and all the events from Kentucky's great history to be told and shared everywhere.